All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this session of Grand Rounds. I'd like to welcome our presenter for today, Stephen Fermanek, who will be presenting on the topic of using Excel to present data for the process control charts. At this time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn the presentation over to Stephen. Hello. Um, give me one second. All right. Is this uh, coming across for everyone? We All right. See it. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Stephen Fermanek. I am a senior biostatistician here in the Norton Infectious Diseases Institute. Um, and so if you remember, uh, several, well, I guess it was close to a year ago, I presented a grand rounds on statistical process control charts. Uh, so this is kind of follow up to that. I had a few people asking, how can I make one of these on my own? Uh, so we're looking at how to do that in Excel, um, which is, uh, the, there are limited options, but it is oftentimes most workplaces will have a Microsoft Office subscription, so um, you could use it pretty easily. Um, so to recap, um, uh, today we're going to look at run charts. Uh, so run charts are a form of statistical process control. Uh, that are very basic, uh, very simple. Um, they're a good starting point because you don't need a lot of points to start a run chart, and they don't assume any sort of distribution. So uh, the run charts will only look at the median uh, of whatever your outcome is. Um, so you can use run charts for several things. You could use it for hand hygiene compliance, um, or if you have like a hospital associated in infection or device associated infections, you could use run charts to also to depict that. Uh, so if we look at a run chart, just to kind of kind of remind everyone, uh, what we are depicting is uh, it's essentially a line chart depicting our uh, outcome of interest. So here we have the rate of an infection per a thousand patient days. Um, and so our data points are going to be on this thick line. Um, and then our center line slash median is going to be the line by, by which we evaluate some of our process control rules. So uh, to briefly summarize, the, the purpose of a statistical process control chart is to try and detect what's known as quote unquote special cause variation. So if you think of um, things such as ventilator use, right, there's a process by which uh, the ventilator is administered or given to the patient. Uh, the patient uses it, there's a decontamination or uh, cleaning uh, phase afterwards, uh, then they have to usually sit for some amount of time with a, a cleaning solution to, to sort of disinfect. Uh, so all of that represents potentially the process. Now the outcome might be, you know, a ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, so one of the rules that is frequently used in run charts to see if there is uh, consequential uh, or sequential, excuse me, increasing points or decreasing points. So typically five points that are increasing sequentially. So right here, that might be some special cause variation indicating that there is a an upward trend uh, in your infections. Uh, or if you have several points below the center line or above. Uh, so this could represent special cause variation there. Uh, being above, and this could also represent special cause variation being below. So maybe we saw that there was an increase in infections, we implemented some sort of intervention, and then we can look to see, okay, our intervention is causing this low rate of infection. So that those are some ways that you can use the process control charts to kind of look at your data. And then really the, the goal is to identify areas to investigate further to say, what happened is this kind of normal or is it something something different going on? So then if we have data specifically for infection control purposes, we need to think about how we're going to structure our data in order to present it. So for a run chart, we have two main pieces of information. We have our outcome that we're looking at. So again, that could be like hand hygiene compliance. It could be device associated infections. And then we have a period of time. Uh, so first to talk about outcomes, uh, outcomes could be measured as frequencies, could be measured as percentages, it could be measured as a rate. Uh, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can present your outcomes. 
Uh, generally, the best practice would be to present a percentage or rate. Uh, however, frequencies are used in uh, some alternative charts uh, to run charts. And then rates and percentages are preferred because they're more directly comparable. So let's say that one day or one month, you uh, you know it's the flu season. You're using the ventilator a lot more often than say after flu season, where you maybe don't see as many uh, pneumonia cases requiring a ventilator or other respiratory illness requiring a ventilator. So if you are looking at ventilator associated pneumonias. Um, you would expect that the more often a ventilator is being used, the more you would opportunities for a ventilator associated pneumonia. So that's why your um, a rate will take into account sort of differences in that ventilator use. So it creates something more directly comparable. Uh, if you just looked at count, you would end up looking at, um, it, you would see potentially a pretty large disparity, and that would just be something indicative of seasonal trend and not necessarily uh, any sort of um, variation. And then rates are usually expressed by a standardizing factor uh, because the events that we have are not often super common. So it could be per 1,000, per 10,000, per 100,000. And a percentage you can actually view as a rate per 100. Um, so that could be um, another way to look at percentages as well. And then for your periods of time, uh, if you can't depict your data over time, then you don't want to look at using a run chart. You might want to look at, say, a bar chart or other sort of visualization methods to look at your, your data. However, if you can depict your data over time, uh, then you want to look at what's the smallest meaningful time period you can work with. Uh, so it needs to be both relevant and attainable. So for example, hand hygiene, you might want to consider every day in terms of the number of, you know, opportunities that you had to um, sort of those, the, the points where hand hygiene and, and sanitizing your hands is relevant. Um, that might be the, your total denominator there. Um, Whereas something like infections might be tracked weekly or monthly, depending on how rare they are. Um, and let's say that you only have dates, like you either have, that's a limitation of your data or your outcomes of interest are so rare that you could, they, you might have like one every few months or one every few weeks. Well, in that case, instead of a run chart, you can consider what's called a G chart, uh, which we'll cover later in this presentation. Um, and G charts actually have pretty similar rules to run charts in terms of how you interpret special cause variation. So that's why I've included them here because there's, um, while they do have a statistical assumption for a, an underlying distribution, there is less, um, it's, it, it's pretty relaxed compared to other process control charts. So then when we're structuring our data in Excel, our column should really look like this if we're looking at a rate, for example. Uh, so we can fill in our uh, dates. So right here we have monthly. And what I suggest using is the start date of each time period for the dates. Uh, the reason being is that way, whenever you have your, um, whenever you label your x-axis as dates, it'll have the start points of each of those time periods. So I've, I'm using fake data here that's just you know totally totally spitballed based on hospital acquired pneumonia uh so let's say that you have a fairly large hospital with um you know roughly 2500 bed days per month uh and then this would be the number of hospital acquired pneumonias that you have potentially per per month so in excel you can actually do kind of simple math uh by using this equal sign for a cell. Uh, so shown here, um, we're going to start typing in this cell here equals, and then we can type in specifically this cell value. You can click to other cells and reference other cells. So if you think of an Excel spreadsheet, kind of like the grid in the, the game Battleship, if you've ever played Battleship, um, your, your cells have an identity that's based on rows and columns. So rows are depicted by numbers in Excel. So that's right here. And then columns are depicted by letters. So here, what we're saying in this 
cell is that we're going to take the value of B2, which is here. So our numerator, our frequency, then we're going to divide by our denominator, which is our number of bed days. So that's in C2. And then we're going to standardize by a factor of 10,000. So again, you can do simple arithmetic this way. Um, and so now our column D is showing our rate per 10,000 bed days. Uh, and actually, the cool thing about Excel is that you can copy uh, a calculated field, and it will automatically update based on the cell's positions. Uh, so if we copy cell D2 and then paste it in cells D3 through D7, this is what our data will look like. Um, so if we look down here at, say, like D6, now instead of B2 and C2, it says B6 and C6. So that's that's a neat feature about Excel. Uh, but it's a blessing and a curse because sometimes you don't want it to automatically update those positions. So there's a way, and we'll we'll get to this in a couple minutes, that you can actually change this and, and modify it so that way um, it, it locks those positions in place. So then if this is what our data looks like, if we just highlight this whole group right here, and then go up to the top bar and say insert and then chart and choose a line chart. This is what our run chart will look like just off the get go. So since we selected all of our data, uh, we have both frequency and bed days also included on this chart. So this chart doesn't look very helpful and it's not very useful because our bed days are dwarfing everything else. Uh, since we only care about plotting the rate here because that's our outcome of interest, we're gonna remove that selection. So what you can do to do that is you can right click on your chart in Excel and then select, click on the select data. And then it'll bring up this kind of um, strange looking menu. So the good news is that you can just uncheck frequency and bed days here and then hit okay. And when you do that, your chart's going to look very rudimentary. So you can compare this chart to um, you can compare this chart to the run chart that we had earlier. So you can see we're still missing that sort of median central line. So that would be the next thing that we want to add on to it. So to add the center line, um, as I've mentioned earlier, the center line is how we use our special cause variation rules. So Currently, what we've produced here is just a line chart, right? There's no central line, so we can't necessarily use this for uh, the, pro the purposes of statistical process control. Um, so we actually don't want to use the mean here for a couple of reasons. The first is that we're, we're only interested in the median because we're assuming no statistical distribution. So the median is the 50th percentile. Um, so what that's saying is that half of your data is going to be above the median and half of it will be below. So if we go back and look here, we can expect that the median is probably going to look like it's going to be around 8.3, you know, 8.4 based on these points because we need three points below and three points above. If we use the average, the average, first of all, since we have a rate with different denominators for each month, if we just simply took these six points and added them up and then took the, the mathematical average of it, we would end up with a, a slightly incorrect average um, because we're not accounting for the, the differences each month in sort of bed days. Um, that's the first issue. And then the second issue is that it's still somewhat um, somewhat dominated by, if if we don't use that method and we do look back and average up you know the total frequency divided by total bed days to get the average there that would function as a weighted average that would be dominated by what has more bed days effectively um so we don't want to assume any statistical distribution so we're just going to use the median um so we're going to create a new column for median rate and then if we hit equals and we type in median that's the function that we use to create a median. So here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna select cells D2 through D7. Uh, so what you can do is you can actually just like click on cell D2 and drag down to D7. Uh, and then if you do select cells that way, you wanna hit enter because if you click somewhere else, it's gonna try and select those cells instead. 
So you want to hit enter. Um, and afterwards, you'll get your median. Now, if you try copying and pasting your median, this is where previously, if you remember, I talked about how it'll update your positions as you go. So here, your median is going to be changing because if you look, it's now grabbing only one value and the rest are blank cells. Uh, so in this case, we need to do something else to, to make sure that we're getting the same median rate each time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these dollar signs before the cell number. Um, so what that's saying is that we're going to, the column D might change, but, but cells two and through cell seven is always going to stay the same, regardless of where we copy and paste this. Um, so now we have the same median rate throughout. And the reason that we're doing this is we're going to add this column as an extra line to our chart. Uh, in Excel, adding a horizontal line is sometimes trickier than other programs. So this is the easiest way to do it, is to just have a new column with all of the same value. So what we're going to do then to add it is we're going to go to our select data source again. So we're going to right click on our graph, on our, our chart, and then we're going to click this button up here where it says chart range. And then it'll open up and we're just going to highlight the whole data set again. So this time we're including median rate inside our data that we're going to chart as well. Uh, so once again, you're going to have to unselect frequency and bed days, but now we're going to have rate and median rate as our two selected, um, as our two selected sort of things were elements were graphing. Now, if you look, our median rate has a bunch of dots that are kind of, they, they kind of can get in the way of interpreting it because we don't want the median rate to be super pronounced. We want it to be visible, but we don't want it to like necessarily overshadow where the dots are for our other pieces. Um, so what we're gonna do, and there's actually several ways that you can do this, uh, but if you right click and say change chart type, uh, what that'll do is it'll open up this little menu. If you go down to combo, uh, it will give you sort of a, a combination chart. What you're going to do now is uh, the median rate is going to be listed as just a, a line without markers. We want to change rate to be line with markers. So you can actually, if you want to have like a bar chart with a, um, a line on top of it, this combo type of chart is actually how you would be able to create that. Uh, but since a run chart is using a line chart and not a bar chart, uh, that's why we want to select line with markers here. Uh, and then median rate, you're going to leave as line. And so now our chart looks like this. Uh, so we have our center line that doesn't have points on it. Uh, so remember that your center line is the median. So because we have an even number of points, we should expect three above and three below, which we do. Here we have one, two, three, and one, two, three. So if you want to give yourself a, a visual, just like pat on the back that, yes, we've added the correct median line, um, that's the way to do it. Now, there's lots of different ways you can customize this chart that I don't really have, unfortunately, enough time to get into. But let's say that you want to format the plot area. That'll pull up a little side menu where you have a ton of options. Uh, so if you click on this chart options up at the top, there's a little area. You can actually essentially change the options for everything. So for example, series median rate, we could go there and that's how you can change the uh, icon. So that way you can get rid of the, the markers, um, but you can change the color there and rate and median rate as well. That's the easiest way to change their color. Uh, in my opinion is in this format chart area. And then if you wanna add an axis title, so for example, our Y axis doesn't have any sort of title or marking. Uh, what you can do is at the top of the screen, uh, what, when you've clicked on the chart, it'll, there will be a little chart tools option. So if you go to design, you can then go to add chart element, access titles, and primary vertical, and that will allow you to add in a chart type. Um, now, I would always recommend that you save your charts before making any changes. And the reason I recommend that is because sometimes you can select an option that you think makes sense, and it will actually be very awful and you may not know how to undo what you did. So I'd recommend saving your changes, 
perhaps even with like a new file name or version number whenever you save. That way you have like a history of versions in case you need to go back to an earlier point. Um, that's my recommendation whenever, like once you get the, the chart created in the first place, before you start fooling around with changing how it looks, I would recommend saving it. Um, so then let's say that you don't wanna use the median line um, and you don't really wanna have it operate as a, a run chart, but you wanna add a trend line. Uh, the easiest way to do that is actually just to right click your rate and then you can select add trend line. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do. Um, and then once you do that, it'll actually open up this little format trend line panel over to the side. There's a ton of different options. So currently I have it set to be a linear trend line. You could have it set to be different sort of um, different trend lines. So moving average might be interesting if you're looking at like a lot of points over time. Um, that that may be more appropriate for you than a linear. Uh, you could also display the equation on chart if you have a linear uh, or a um, a trend line that follows a distribution. Um, however, adding the slope and intercept to the line in terms of the equation may not necessarily be what you think it is. Uh, the slope is going to give you the daily change, not monthly. So what this is saying here is that we're losing about five hundredths of an infection per 10,000 patient days each day, right? So that that's not really a, a, a meaningful like interpretation there. Um, and then our intercept is looking at what was the, proje the projected rate on January 1st, 1900, right? So it's saying that we would have roughly 2,000 um, infections per 10,000 bed days back in 1900. So there's obviously, you have to take the trend lines with a little grain of salt. Um, I wouldn't rely too much on the equation for them just to kind of show that, hey, there's a downward trend. Um, that may be the, the more appropriate thing to, to use for them. However, let's say that you want to show trend a different way um, and that maybe you had a intervention that happened. So if we look at our previous um, example, let's say that after you know three months, we said, okay, we're gonna start a, a new intervention to try and reduce our hospital acquired pneumonias because that was what we'd originally said for our example. So starting in April, we're going to implement this new sort of protocol. Uh, what you can do is you can actually create a median for these first three months and the second three months. Um, now, the I will let you know that because we only have six months, the medians are going to look a little goofy here, uh, and it will look better if you have more data points. But for the purposes of showing you how to do this, we're, we're just going to say the intervention started in April, so we have three months pre and three months post intervention. Uh, so instead of adding a median column, we're actually going to add two columns for the median. Uh, and so what we're going to say here is that we want our median to be just these three for our first three intervention months because we were January through March. So we're going to use the dollar signs here to make sure that when we copy and paste this, we get the same median for these three time points. And then we're going to leave these last three blank. What, sec what that's going to mean is that when we try to add this line to our chart, it's only going to show up for those first three months. And then since it's blank for these three, it won't show up for the second three. So then if we're gonna have the post median, what we're gonna do is we're going to add essentially the same thing just for the last three months. And we're going to leave sort of the corresponding pre months blank. So that way those first three months show up as blank for this line. Uh, that way we can end up with essentially two different lines for the median. Uh, so when we, we, we're going to add these the same way as we did previously with uh, select data and then re-highlight the whole chart. Um, and so this is after kind of tinkering with the chart a little bit to make it look better. This is how that would look like when you add these two. Uh, again, it's the same way of changing these median lines to, to drop their sort of markers so that they're smooth lines. Um, the same way for a bunch of things. So uh, in terms of if we want to, if we add the whole data set again, we're gonna to have to remove bed days and frequency again. Otherwise we're gonna end up with, you know, a weird looking graph. Um, and so in this example, again, because it's the median, it's actually centering the line at that middle point. 
So right here, this is the median point because it's the you know 50th percentile in here. So again, as I said, since there's only three points, it's a little, you know, it, it doesn't look super great. Um, having more um have it, having more data points will always make you know your run chart look better. Um so then earlier I alluded to what if we only had dates of events? Uh, and I know I am, you know, this this will I'll I'll go pretty quick through this, but um if if you only have dates for events, then you want to look instead at the time between events. So over here we have, you know, the the think of it as like the days without accident. That's kind of what we're thinking of is we're going to be counting days without events. Um, so a G chart is what depicts the time between events. So this is kind of what our G chart that we'll make will look like. Uh, and so they do assume that there's a geometric distribution. Um, however, they have pretty lax like control limits in terms of there's typically only an upper control limit shown uh, and the average time between events shown. There's not like if you remember the other process control charts, we had like, you know, one, two and three lines for control limits. Uh, there's nothing of that sort. And they have essentially the same sort of rules in terms of number of points above the average, number of points below the average, um, alternating up and down points uh, sequentially, uh, increasing points sequentially, decreasing points sequentially. So very similar interpretation to run charts. Uh, but here we're looking at time between events. So then for a G chart, we really only need two columns and you're going to start essentially with only one column because you only have the dates of the events. Um, but we need to calculate the time between events. So the way you want to do this is you want to make sure that your dates are being formatted as a date in Excel. Uh, so essentially you can just click on that cell and then look up at the top and it'll have the format if it says date up there. You're good. Um, Excel is usually pretty good about interpreting things as dates whenever you type them in as a date. Uh, and you want to make sure that you have a consistent format for this as well, of course. Um, so then in order to get our time between events, if they're formatted as dates, you can actually just subtract these two cells from each other. So right here, we're going to say cell A3. We're going to subtract cell A2 from it. Uh, and then that gives us the following time between events. Uh, we're always going to have one less time between events than we have number of events because you know, we're subtracting the two from each other. So this first one, we're going to leave blank. So then uh, they use the average uh, as our center line. So instead of using median, we're now going to use average. And then we're going to grab the average. And again, we're going to use dollar signs to make sure that the average is going to be the same at every time point. And I didn't show this originally, but the average time at the top actually should also be um, filled in. Uh, because our line is going to cover the whole whole data set. Um, and so we're going to add this to the chart, just like we're adding a median to a run chart. It's pretty much the exact same process. Now, I, the upper control limit uh, is a slightly more complicated formula. I have it depicted here. Essentially, this G with a little bar over it is just the average time between events, which is what we just calculated uh, previously. So we're going to use that three times in this formula. Um, so it's a little bit easier to plug into the calculation. It looks daunting, um, but it's not, it's not too bad. Um, now it, it looks worse when you type it into the, um, Excel calculator to calculate the field. So here we have C2, right? That's our average. That's our G bar plus three times the square root of, and then we have C2 times C2 plus one. So C2, if we look here, that's C2 times C2 plus one. Um, and you can use the square root function. So if you do square root and then open parentheses, that'll get this, that'll take the square root of everything that's inside there. Uh, and so Excel follows the PEMDAS um, sort of order of operations. So we can, we can write it like this and it will, you know, correctly sort it out. So our upper control limit for this is going to be roughly 68.5. Uh, and then we're going to add this the same way as the median to our control chart. So um, again, the same way as everything, one of the things that you might want to do is you might want to format the axis on your control chart. So it is, um, it's, it's going vertically. Um, that way you can fit all of it. Excel likes to truncate the dates, so it won't necessarily show you all the dates. Uh, but if you look here, it has the date of the event 
and then the next date being depicted. Um, so it'll it'll show you the time between events. So then here um, we have, as I said, uh, the same sort of rules. There's one additional rule, which is that if you have any points above this upper control limit, that's automatically considered special cause variation. Now that's good special cause variation, and you should probably investigate how you accomplished that because that's saying that we had a very long time between events. In this case, it was you know potentially more than two months, um, is 68 days, so almost two and a half months potentially um, between events. So that would be for something that's a rare uh, outcome, that would be something good, right? So that's, that's where you want to be is, is seeing points up there. Uh, and you can also, similarly to um, the pre and post intervention that we had for the run charts, you could actually do a pre and post average for a G chart as well. So then in closing, um, I know that I have uh, been a very brisk going through this um, and I'll make sure that these slides are available to you guys. That way you all can follow along. Uh, there's several ways to produce charts for looking at process control trends um, and Excel. And this is just a few. There's like lots of different ways to, to produce these figures. Um, but this is just saying, hey, if I want to get started, this is how I can um, kind of take that first step. Uh, and then I strongly suggest that you practice and experiment uh, because that's the only way to kind of learn new things. Uh, and if you're interested in statistical inference, I would also suggest that you don't use Excel or you work with a statistician. Uh, the reason being is you can manually code test statistics in Excel, but it's it is complicated and it's easy to screw up. Um, so I would I would strongly suggest you you don't rely on Excel for doing that type of things. Um, yeah. And then does anyone have any questions or uh, things for discussion? All right. Um, All right. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to the group for being here for this wonderful presentation, and I invite you to join us next week where Dr. Alan Junkins will be discussing laboratory detection of uh, mycobacterial infections. So I look forward to seeing everybody then. Thanks so much.